Ani, Bojo, Wache, Scano, Tansi. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our um, third webinar in the series of Indigenous Conversations. We would like to organize or to recognize and thank the Ontario Trillium Foundation Resilient Communities Fund for their financial support to help us bring Indigenous conversations to a wider community through this webinar series. Today, the speaker will be Kim Wheatley. She is a traditional Anishinaabe grandmother. Kim Wheatley is Turtle and Bear Clan from Shawanaga First Nation Reserve, who carries the spirit name Shkoden Nigan Wawash Genon, head of the leader, head or leader of the fire flyer, flower, sorry. She is a multi award winning speaker and published author who has presented locally, nationally and internationally, while also having appeared on television, radio, in books and many news articles. Kim currently provides Indigenous consultations, continues to organize events, writes for a local newspaper, and is working on a new book. Everybody please welcome Kim Wheatley. That was a beautiful introduction. I'm so grateful to have my sister Faith introduce me, but I'm going to introduce myself again because I think it's really important to set the tone of engagement. It's my honor to be here today and I want to thank everybody behind the scenes who's making sure that this travels along nice and smooth. So Anin Bojo, that means my spirit recognizes your spirit. Mashikin Gi Makwa and Dodem. I'm Turtle and Bear Clan. Shkoden Nigan Wawaskonen and Dijnakaz. I'm known as or referred to as head or leader of the Fire Flower. And I am Anishinaabe, Kwe, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Caribbean, and Dao. So I bring, uh, I bring my ancestral lineage uh, to this dialogue because we are talking about Indigenous uh, ways of knowing and being and doing in lots of capacities. And I have the honor of being the third presenter in this series. I'm currently tuning in today from the traditional treaty territory um, 20, which is uh, part of the Michisagi territory. So Hiawatha, Curve Lake and Alderville First Nation are all kind of circling where I'm at uh, on this day. And it's such an honor to be here. I wanna start off in a good way. And so um, what we do is we smudge. So I'm gonna cyber smudge everybody here. And then I'm also going to try and keep us on track by um, sharing a PowerPoint because I love visuals. But before I do that, I want to offer a song. I think songs are really important. It's the, it's the way that we can encourage you to come from here down to your heart space and listen in that way. So I invite you to take a couple of deep breaths. Make sure that you're nice and comfortable. Maybe have a glass of water nearby to quench your thirst, but also to connect to that life force that connects us all and to kind of draw our minds together and thinking about, you know, the first three orders of creation, that would be the mineral world. So this is all of the sands, the soils, the clays, the gravels, the rocks, the stone beings in the mountains. They are the most ancient beings on earth. And they're the ones that know all the stories, the songs, the teachings that have ever been shared. They're the great memory keepers. And so on this day, as I sing this song, I invite you to think about them and to honor them in all of those good ways. I also wanna uh, refer to the second order of creation, which is all of the grasses, the shrubs, the trees, the bushes, the hardwoods, the softwoods, the berries, the hanging fruits, and all of the medicines. When we look at this, um, you know, the second order of creation, they wrap their roots around those grandmothers and grandfathers. And that's what we call that first order of creation because they're so old. That's a term of respect. And, and as they wrap their roots around those beautiful beings, they also sacrifice their bodies for our well-being. So when we're not well, it help, they help to heal our bodies. And when we're hungry, they help to fill our bellies. And um, when we're looking for something to stimulate our senses, they provide endless beauty. And so on this day, I invite you to think about them as I offer this opening song. And then we want to draw our attention to the third order of creation, our elder brothers and sisters. Now, these beautiful beings are our companions, our food source, and also our teachers. And I referred to them when I introduced myself and Faith introduced myself as part of our governance system as well. That's what clans are. It's our governance system. And I thank them for all of their sacrifices, everything that they teach us, everything that they do for us. 
And so uh, on this day, I encourage you as well, as I sing the song, to think about them. Um, the fourth order of creation is the babies, that's human beings. And we come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. And as we think about our families, our immediate families, our extended families, our networks, and all the, you know, the things that um, help us to feel a sense of relationship to each other. Um, so it might be friends, you know, it might be siblings, it might be extended family, it might be co-workers. I invite you to think about that world today and give them greetings and thanks. And just really place yourself in relationship to all of these things I spoke about, because they're important components of not only who we are, but what our daily life needs to be. And so I'm going to offer a grandmother song for you. It's one that my daughter taught me. And I've got my little helper here. I'm just using a little drum. And let's hope the sound doesn't get all wonky. Um, but I'm going to offer this song to each and every one of you. Yo way high up high song. So I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint because I do have lots of visuals to share with you. And I focused my presentation on talking about, uh, let me see here. I want to get a slideshow on the go. Lots of decisions to make here. I have some, whew, I have some skills here. So in the work that I'm doing, and I do all kinds of work, I'm a mother and I'm a grandmother, and I noticed in the world that I engage in that there are very few female mentors in the area of harvesting. And that's hunting. In hunting and trapping and fishing, those kinds of um, harvesting um, spaces and places, you see very few women there. And I got a vision um, a couple years ago about this space and flushing it back out again in the way it used to be before to restore some balance and harmony. And so I'm going to share a project that I'm working on with with all of you today, and I hope that you enjoy it. And the project is called Reclaiming Ancestral Harvesting Practices. And it's a big project. It's a one year long project. And I'm so, so proud of the work that I'm doing in this project. I always like to start things off in a good way because Indigenous people have always welcomed learning and sharing in what we call a good way way. Um, and that's based on many traditional customs, uh, ceremonies, and relationship practices. And so we bring, you know, we bring our helpers with us. So what you're looking at here is just uh, a bundle, one of my many bundles that I use to help teach, share, and connect. And I hope that you're feeling a bit more connected after that uh, song and, and that bit of introduction to perhaps what to focus on. So the words I said, Anin Bojo, if you don't know those words, try them. I've written them phonetically for you. Anin Bojo Kinawea. That means greetings, my relatives. And we, you know, we take this time, we take a long time actually to kind of settle you in and, and help you to feel connected. Um, Faith did the beautiful land acknowledgement for her traditional treaty territory, the, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and they're amazing. In 
in all the work that they do and they have a vast area to take care of and so it's it's um it's always good to recognize whose land you're living working and playing upon it helps to honor the ancestors you know who make up the the very ground that you are walking on but also it helps to connect us ancestrally and in a contemporary sense in all of those good ways so we take time to speak the language we take time to welcome you we take time to recognize you and this is what we call a welcome to learning in a good way with a good heart and a good mind um, i already talked about the treaty 20 territory that i'm tuning in from today and I did a cyber smudge. Now, cyber smudging is just as effective as physical smudging because spirit knows no bounds. And what I want to really emphasize here today is we're spiritual beings having a physical experience and not physical beings having a spiritual experience. And so when you put yourself into context and relationship with that, of course, spirit can travel across all of these technological spaces and places and still reach our hearts. And what smudging does is it helps to cleanse your mind so you think only good things and cleanse your eyes so you can see only good things and clear your ears so you can hear only good things. And of course, we put it across our mouth so we can see good things a lot of us need to be smudging when we're driving our traffic i think because man <laughs> the things that come out of our mouths in those situations uh, and there's always room for humor in our teachings you know and in our sharing so never feel like you need to be real stiff and rigid um, there will be time for questions after the presentation but i just want to get through the presentation and share the project that i've been working on and just how profoundly impactful it it I hope will be, um, you know, generations from now in that more and more uh, women and those that identify as women are able to pick up this practice in a more meaningful way. And so we want to set the tone of engagement. We want to make sure that everybody's feeling good. We want to clear that space. And one other cool thing about smudging that you may not know is it's antimicrobial. So it actually helps to clean the atmosphere. So how cool is that in this day and age where we're so afraid of viruses and bugs? We want to keep our spaces as clear as possible. And it's also not the kind of um, sage, that's what you're seeing in the picture here, that you stuff in your turkeys. <laughs> it's a one sage and it's different for sure and it grows all over our great island which is North America. we call it Turtle Island. Now Indigenous people have resided on Turtle Island for time and a lot of people have a hard time with what's time immemorial what does that mean it's literally thousands and thousands of years my friend Phil Cote says we've been here for over two ice ages that's uh, captured in our orality, in our oral legends and stories. So that's a pretty long time. And it might be surprising for you to learn that there were literally millions of residents on these lands before the colonial flow began to arrive on our eastern shore. Right? We had very complex cities and we had very complex trade routes. And we traveled literally from the, the most northern part of our island all the way down into South America. So this is a pretty large travel route. Now, how did we do we use the original highways? Right? The waterways, of course, the rivers, the streams, the oceans, the lake, um, very complex interwoven uh, travel system that made it possible for us to travel all the way south and all the way north. Another thing that um, would have been a norm in that time, only a long travel and trade routes, but we spoke many, many languages. It wasn't uncommon to speak a half dozen to a dozen languages easily because in a trade route, you need to be able to communicate. And so even though our languages are very distinct, um, people who, who were on the trade route became experts at speaking multiple languages. This is really interesting because when you look at Canada today, Kanata today, uh, not even a micro percentage of Canadians can recognize an Indigenous language, let alone speak it. Even just to say the basics like Anin, Bojo. Um, the two official languages here come from France and England, but no Indigenous language is recognized here. And that's a great sadness. Um, maybe we can change that a little bit. But here's something else to consider. All First Nations um, conducted outstanding land stewardship practices. Now, what's land stewardship? It's being in right relationship to those first orders of creation that I talked about and honoring them as living beings who have rights and, and we have responsibilities to them. And so all First Nations did this and they never harmed any of the mineral plant or animal kin. 
we call them our kin because they are our relatives, right? We never polluted one river, stream, lake. We never cut down uh, any forest, you know, to the point of extinction. This word that we use today, species at risk, is a really new word and it's directly man related. We have caused harm to our kin. And, and it's because we're not making choices to respect their right to life, their right to a home, their right to spaces and places that they originally come from. And so um, historically, we understood this. We always respected the spaces and places we went to. We knew that everybody had to take care of those particular that's traditional territories. What was in there and what needed the most help? Uh, and it was very, very minutely organized and well known and and shared um, throughout the nation so that everybody was on board showing that perhaps the deer this year are not doing so we won't hunt deer this year. That's how minute it was. And also the words that we have to describe our relationship to Earth speak volumes about the respect, the care, the understanding of what our relationship is to them and that it was equal. Um, there was no kind of imbalance in terms of how we looked at the earth, how we responded to her. We, you know, we consider her our mother. And relationships to land for all people, not just for Indigenous people, are integral for well-being. And there's a, a beautiful elder, Doreen Spence, and she says, you can influence one person at a time, or you can have a group of people that you work with to pass sacred teachings onto them so that future generations will have something to look forward to. Now she's talking about relationships to land and she's talking about how this is important and how intergenerationally in our communities, we this was a norm. This was not something that people deviated from. If the land was harmed, then we would be harmed. It's very, very obvious. And and if the land was harmed, that was due to unbalanced energies. And so being unbalanced as a human being uh, has uh, repercussions and impacts to the environment around us as well. So she speaks about unbalanced energies and how they cannot be shared with entities around us. And those entities are our kin, right? That's the mineral, the plant, and the animal world. To, to engage in reciprocal relationships, balanced relationships requires a space of calmness place of centeredness and focus to get the work done. And the work is to, you know, on our relationship. So that's why I took the time to introduce myself and get you to put your feet on the ground and, and maybe have a, a glass of water is to prepare you, to prepare you for the journey and to encourage you to go inwards and really examine how you fit into this story and why this might be important to you. Learning about ancestral harvesting, harvest, harvest, sorry, my tongue's gone on vacation. Lear today, learning about ancestral harvesting practices for women is challenging. We do not see female uh, leadership and mentorship in in different places. Uh, we're, we're starting to see a bit of a surge upwards where we're a bit more prominent, but it's certainly a challenge. You have to look, you have to look for these, these women, these leaders. And, you know, in Canada, we have 634 First Nations with over 50 languages being spoken right today. I know that most Canadians are told that we're a dying race and we're, we have a dying language, but this is not true. Um, we're certainly having this resilience and resurgence of reclamation in lots of different ways. And as, as we walk the road of reconciliation, you know, more supports are in place to ensure that that can continue. In Canada, they recognize, you may or may not know this, but to make sure that we're all on the same page, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. Those are the three groupings that are enshrined in the Canadian Constitution. But it's very deceiving when you look at these three groupings because it seems like just a small pocket of people. First Nations alone, if there's 634 First Nations communities, it tells you that there's a lot of us here in Canada. So that, that umbrella term First Nations makes it seem very um, small, uh, but we're actually the largest group in Canada and we go from coast to coast to coast. Métis people are of European Indigenous ancestry and through multiple generations have developed their own um, language and their own customs and they generally originate from the Red River District in Manitoba. 
uh, Red River uh, region, sorry. And of course the Inuit people, they live above the tree line. There are four different uh, land bases up there with six different groupings of people who speak distinct languages as well and have distinct uh, relationships and responsibilities to the territories of their ancestors. But if collectively, we're all sovereign nations. Sovereignty means that we have special rights and privileges in this country, which are distinctly different from other Canadians' rights and privileges because we have uh, a traditional um, kind of foundation to these uh, rights and privileges, especially connected to harvesting. Today, they call it hunting. And for us, it's never about hunting. It's always about harvesting in a good way based on need. And you never take more than you actually need. So my project got funding from the Indigenous Innovation Initiative. This is a relatively new federal um, funding stream directed at Indigenous people in particular and, and Indigenous women or those that identify as Indigenous and, um, and as female. And in this project, um, I, I wanted to focus on harvesting practices. First, with the water, because water is life. And when we think about our relationship to water as women, it's also our traditional responsibility. I would get a group of women together, um, mostly from cities and some from on reserve, to participate in this project. And I had a big vision when I first started, but then COVID hit us. And as COVID hit us, of course, the things had to get smaller and smaller. Now, this was a federally offered grant across Canada. There were 243 applications. They narrowed it down to 46 possibilities and they funded 10. So out of, out of 243, I'm one of the lucky 10, and I received a huge chunk of money to try out this idea, this idea of enriching and reclaiming um, the, the way that we used to interact with, with the world around us to help support our health and wellness, to support our families, and to support the traditional practices that help to, to uh, maintain balance and harmony in relationship to the natural world. So I chose um, women of all ages and uh, experience levels. It didn't, you didn't have to know anything. Uh, you could come absolutely green and we'd take it from there. And I, I used knowledge keepers and elders from three different communities uh, to, to support this project. So they continue to support us. So here's a small grouping of us here. And I partnered with three communities. That would be Shawanaga First Nations, which is the community I'm from, Georgina Island, which is just north of Toronto, and then Doki's First Nations, which is south east of um, North Bay. I have to kind of put you in relation to cities you already know, because most people are unfamiliar with First Nations communities here in Ontario. But there are 134. There's a brand new one, Caldwell, so we'd say there's 135 uh, here in Ontario. And they are, they, they spread across the entire province. So as we look, um, as we look for, um, you know, uh, Indigenous uh, representation in this province it's vast we have a large population here and we also have the largest um, the largest first nations reserve is six nations everybody thinks that you know we're all from six nations but that's not true they are a longhouse community um, Haudenosaunee people of the longhouse and then the majority of the people who live in Ontario are either Anishinaabe Cree people um, so we make up the largest uh, portion of Indigenous communities and languages spoken in this province. I needed a strong support team, um, and I also needed balanced energies. Even though this is focused on women and it's women-led, we had to have men in there as well. Uh, the energy of male and female responsibilities and relationships are really, really important. What you're looking at here is the the, uh, the four women, so from the left to the right, um, those four women are actually the leads in the project, and then the two men are the supports who um, who who made sure that we had, I don't know, like some of the physical things, and and also they brought uh, ceremony um, ceremonial balance um, to the project itself. So I'm so grateful for them. 
um, Amber Sandy, uh, James Dokis, he's from Dokis First Nations and he carries the, the last name as his surname. Of course, myself. Um, next to me is um, James' daughter and she is just brilliant um, on the land in the water. She's a fisherwoman and she's an expert hunter and her name's EJ. Next to EJ, we had uh, Donna Longlad who has spent, she's 78, and uh, she spent her entire life on the shores of water, so she knows everything. She still fishes, she still paddles her canoe, she still swims, she still does all kinds of things um, at her age that are, they seem pretty youthful. And next to her is her partner, Vince Paywis, who had a lot of tools and he had a ceremonial space that we could actually gather in. And he runs a program for children uh, called White Buffalo Road Healing Lodge, where he brings children who are in care into relationship with the land as well. So we got to tap into his experience and knowledge in that capacity. I needed a co-lead, so I, I found a strong co-lead, Amber Sandy. She's an expert in hide tanning and fish skin tanning and, um, and, and, and relationships to the land that helped to create items that actually supported our way of life. So, and we understood that this project was really focused on rematriating those spaces. So rematriation is kind of a new movement that's also starting to come to light. And in the field of harvesting, we're just, we're just not there. There's just so few of us uh, doing this type of work. Um, in this project, as I said, we focused on water and our vision was a four season immersion where we ha have the opportunity to learn rod fishing, ice fishing, spear fishing and net fishing and what those techniques involve, you know, what season you do, do you do that, what location you might go to. So we had a lot of um, focus on making sure that any skill that was shared with the women who participated in the project was repeatable, that they could do it in their own right. And we also wanted to experience open water fishing and river fishing. So before we got started, we did lots and lots of ceremony because ceremony is basically the request from the spirit world, from the ancestors to come and support the spirit of the animals, the spirit of our relatives, the spirit of the plant beings. We need to speak to them all. And so we had a sweat lodge and everybody had an opportunity to prepare themselves body, mind, spirit in that sacred space, which replicates rebirthing, right? So we're, we're trying something new. So we're going to birth this new project. So it makes sense that we would go into a sweat lodge. Of course, having feast food, which, which we share symbolically with the unseen world and the seen world is, is a great it also helps the meet and greet process to be really nice and smooth because these women for the most part didn't know each other and so they were coming together getting to know each other uh, in some sort of relationship so once we got out into the spaces and places we'd be working in they would feel comfortable with each other we made many offerings there were pipe ceremonies there were tobacco offerings and in this image here in the bottom left hand corner of your screen you can see that donna's placing tobacco on a sacred site we actually went out into georgian bay and there's a beautiful sacred site there called turtle rock and if you look carefully you can see that she's placing an offering on the turtle's head it's a huge space and we've been placing offerings there for just as long as I can ever remember. And there's all kinds of things. Underneath the turtle's chin, there's a little ledge there. and There's little um, moccasins and coins and um, our four sacred medicines, cedar, sage, sweet grass, and tobacco. There's just all kinds of things there that are left to honor the lands, the ancestors, you know, looking for guidance, looking for support, looking for those connections. And then, of course, we had sharing circles where each person got to introduce themselves, talk they came to the project, and what they're hoping to achieve. Everybody has their own ideas. Four R's of engagement. Respect, relationship, and responsibility are the, the kind of the foundational pieces. We need to come, you know, with these basic principles. And, and, and this will help to guide our values connected to all things, both seen and unseen. Because the spirit world is just as important to us as the physical realm. And everything that we're engaging with has a spirit. So we wanted to, you know, learn and come with the, the foundational uh, understanding that we need to do this in a respectful way. 
Um, and, and when we're establishing some sort of respect or recognition of other living beings, we, we, we build that relationship. And, and that's part of our cultural foundation is we have to come with that respect and relationship as a foundational principle. We, and we build around these concepts. With respect and relationship, we get responsibility because once you have developed a relationship, you're responsible for nurturing that, honoring that in all of those good ways. So I, I mentioned that we never harvest more than 25% of anything that we're engaging with so that we give those communities, those families, those beings an opportunity to um, kind of regrow themselves and, and have a, a good chance of survival. So, so we honor their sacrifices. We know they have to give up life so we can have life, but we don't take all of their life so that they disappear as well. And that's part of reciprocity, right? It's part of giving back and honoring that this project uh, is, is requiring not only those four R's, but um, really embedding those as values and normal practices in everything that you do. Because what we have learned about uh, harvesting is that it's not just the words and it's not just the respect, it's the feelings that you carry. So if you're coming out like with a, maybe the energy of greed, uh, they say that everything will hide from you. Nothing will offer itself up to you. So, so you have to kind of step back and get back into that place of respect and, and ask them with offerings, with tobacco, to give up their life on this day, you know, so that we can have that learning, we can have that, that uh, experience, we can have that perhaps food uh, uh, that supports our well-being. So there's very important aspects of harvesting that we need to really focus on. And so this project was more than just experiential. It was also very culturally grounded and founded. Indigenous people hold a universal understanding, which is on the earth. No one owns it. She's our first mother. She supplies everything we need to live a good long life. And process, she asks nothing of us, you know, just to, just to um, say thank you, you know, and never take more than you need. So maybe that's two things. But because we're guests, it's our responsibility to hold respect and nurture a relationship, to support good reciprocity with her in lots of meaningful ways. And, you know, sometimes people don't think, well, you know, nobody's here, nobody will see me, nobody will know. The earth knows. So you have to do this regardless of whether people are observing and noticing and commenting or not. So we started with um, outdoor immersion. Everybody came up from the city. And uh, we slept outside, you know, to really have this uh, immersion component. And all the ladies came together and helped set up tents and bring their stuff and, you know, kind of slow down. The city brings you up and you're just like buzzing. You're buzzing with energy. And you need to slow down because that buzzing with energy that comes from a city is not conducive to the natural environment. It scares them. It does not allow them to recognize who you are. So slowing down allows your spirit to kind of surge forth and then the world around you uh, gets to recognize who you are. And then this harmony starts to evolve where you just, you know, you're more relaxed, you're breathing deeply, you're not rushing around. Maybe you're gonna be a little bit more quiet. You know, the world is very chatty these days and, and the, uh, the natural world doesn't enjoy that from us. So we have to learn to be quiet. All the women uh, took time to get to know each other before we headed out and started um, you know, we, we kind of arrived and we welcomed each other and we, we helped set up tents and then we had little pockets of, of chatting women here and there, getting to know why they came and, you know, and exploring the excitement and, of course, slowing down. Um, safety is key in any project and this project involved going out on the water. Some of the women were swimmers, some were not swimmers, uh, some had, you know, some experience in this realm, some had no experience and so we had to give a lot of um, training and we gave them all kinds of supplies for this so things like life jackets and the rods they need and the worms and how to get on a boat and how to get off a boat and how to tie it off and tie it on and and uh, how to maintain balance on the boat itself like everybody would go to one side of the boat it would tip it, things like that so there was lots of preparation time and an actual um immersion into that um, learning how to load and unload seems pretty basic but a lot of the women had never been on a boat before and so we had to deal with things like fear 
uh, some some were really scared to just even step onto it. And we used pontoons, which are pretty stable and can hold a large number of people. So we had two pontoons. Um, so, so some of the ladies had a bit of a meltdown for a moment and then realized it was perfectly safe and they would be all right. And of course there's seats on there. So it's very much sitting like in a car, except it's on water. Um, so that, that really helped them to, to get more comfortable. Uh, in Georgian Bay, we focused on open water fishing and open water fishing in this beautiful lake is something that I grew up with and grew, um, really familiar with uh, but a lot of the city ladies they just never had that opportunity even though toronto is close to uh, um, lake ontario people don't actually get in boats and go out there you know it's kind of like a, an elitist uh, neighborhood that people engage with there but in georgian bay it's considered cottage country and in cottage country there's a thousand boats and there's all kinds of homes around the the, the shores, but the waters themselves are, are the place where historically we received nourishment. This is, this is the space and place for food sovereignty for us. In the summertime, we moved to the water's edge and we uh, fished for all kinds of things, including plant beings and um, berries and of course, all kinds of fish, but other things as well that, you know, wasn't just fish, there's clams and there's uh, medicines from the different plant beings that are in the water itself. So um, we, we explored some of that with the ladies in this project. Outing, <laughs> heading through some of the channels in Georgian Bay. There's lots and lots of islands out there. It is extraordinarily beautiful. And we, we happen to pick a really good day to go out. So lucky for us. Uh, the, the city folk never go anywhere without their phones. So if you take a close look at it, you can see that most of them are on their phones. And uh, they're trying to capture moments. You know, this is so exciting for them. They want to capture every moment and be able to share their experience. But also, it's a good way for them to have this kind of living uh uh, visual document of where they went and what they did and what was said and you know help them to be able to repeat this experience in meaningful ways without our guidance all women were encouraged to get a boating license and we have a, a couple of those small um, tin can type boats with small motors that they're all getting a chance to uh, try and operate and turn on and um, you know motor a little bit around in in the open water um, and so, so that was really exciting for them because that would mean post this event, they would have a bit of experience to be able to take their own boat rental. The, uh, the women within the project itself, once they were on board, uh, pun intended, used a lot of observation, uh, plus support. So guided support, look here, see this, try this, hold this, uh, to really upgrade their learning experience. So it wasn't just talking to them, it was actually putting a rod in their hands, getting them to you know, the, uh, know how to release the line and, and how to put the worm on the hook and how to make sure the hook's actually tied onto your line well and how to replace that should your hook get stuck and, and things like that. So what I found with the women is lots of screaming when the worms first came out and nobody wanted to touch the worms. But uh, after they put their line in and started getting uh, the attention of fish in the water and they were able to see that, uh, Georgian Bay's pretty clear water so when you look in you can actually see into the water um, they were able to pick up the next worm and put it on without the screaming and the ooze and I need a worm and just slapping it on the hook so that was really rewarding to see how they were overcoming even the smallest of fears through the the immersion process and this is where I think the power of this project is is it is completely immersive we were working through our groups of people a lot and so we were able to do the social distancing and and some people just kept their masks on as well but when we were actually out fishing the success was so if you look down where the shadow is on the floor there's a big fish there and and that was uh, pulled up and the, <laughs> the right away quick and everybody was scrambling over to take a picture they were so excited and so surprised at how 
fishing works. You know, you're putting a worm on a hook, you put it in the line, put the line in the water, and then you get a bite. Um, so lo again, lots of screaming, but so much fun. And uh, we talked a lot about health and wellness connected to eating fish. Fish hold certain nutrients that are really beneficial for the body. And, and we know that um, healthy fish uh, are in deeper waters. Um, so not so close to shores where uh, people have their cottages and whatnot, but um, health and wellness was a norm for us. The way that we ate, the food that came from the land was the way that we maintained a very robust lifestyle and, um, and had very long uh, active lifestyles as well. So these are lifetime skills that we're resurrecting and we're supporting again food sovereignty. Food does not just come from a grocery store. It comes from the natural world. And a lot of people who live in the city are disconnected from that process. So the respect, the honoring, the sacredness of obtaining your own food and seeing that life disappear so that you can have life is really jolting for some people. And it was hard for some of the women in the project to come to terms with the fact that they, uh, the process of fishing means you're actually going to take life or life givers. So of course it would be hard. And we had a huge shared harvest. Every single woman in the project caught a fish. You can see that this line is absolutely full. And one of the young girls just wanted to pick it all up and see what it was like to hold that many fish at once. And then she was just, uh, just awed by the fact that this is food. Like we can get this food and literally feed ourselves, our families, our communities in lots of good ways. So they learned and bass and smallmouth bass and um, that was wherever we were, that's all that was pretty much turning up. And they learned about what size to take and, you know, um, to look for health and wellness and also um, how to clean the fish. A lot of people have different techniques and each woman got to see what it was like and then got to try it because we had lots of fish, so everybody got to try. And they also learned about giving back. So we, it's our custom that the bones of the fish are returned to the water so that they can um, honor their relatives who've given up life. The fish honor their fish relatives, you know, the ones who've given up life. And also we, we share this harvest with the other beings. So of course the seagulls come and many other beings come to, to nibble on those leftovers as well. Watching how to clean fish and then actually doing it are two distinct skill sets. And so it was really important for the women to have an opportunity to actually put a knife in their hands and learn how to clean the fish effectively. Uh, and it was exciting, again, understanding a, a lot about size and health through that process was important as well. So we don't take fish that are too small. We make sure we return them back healthy into the water as quickly as possible. And when we're cleaning the fish, you can see whether it's healthy or not by the color and the texture and the tone of what you've actually captured. So that was important as well. And, and we also took um, the skins off of the fish and we tanned the fish skins, which was just the coolest process ever. And my co-lead Amber brought that technique to us. And it was something that we did historically. And um, if, you, if you look at a fish and when you take the skin off, it feels very flimsy, but at the end of tanning, it's almost like a piece of leather. It's very, very um, strong, very beautiful. And we tanned it with tea. Um, and, and, we were so successful in fishing, we had to literally say, okay, we're going to stop. And what that taught the women is one, don't take more than you need, but also honor, um, you know, the, the sacrifices that these beautiful beings are making for us. We literally, uh, every time we put our line in up uh, a fish and we wanted to ensure that those that come after us have an opportunity to experience this and receive that nourishment that comes from our beautiful clean freshwater lakes so that was the end of our first day beautiful sunset and lots of excitement one of the one of our um boats broke down and we literally had to take shoelaces and all kinds of things bras we tied them all together to make a line to tow to tow <laughs> one of the pontoons it worked out beautifully and at the end of the day um, everybody was pretty excited but also pretty exhausted our next outing took place in Dokis first nations and it was not so long ago 
it's a long drive from Toronto um, and Doki's First Nations is very remote in lots of ways. It took a long time for them to get a road to their community, um, but their ice was very thick this year and they welcomed us for ice fishing and they had all of the tools and they were able to teach us so many things about how to prepare for ice fishing. And for those who've never done ice fishing before, and I'm one of them, uh, it was instrumental to hear special techniques and also the cultural foundational principles in which we actually do ice fishing. Because every time we do any kind of harvesting, it's always got a cultural foundation. It's always got stories connected to it. There's always special ways or unique tricks and tips that each person brings to the table. So all the women were given a, a custom jig. So you can see it looks like a fish. It's laying on the table there. And a jig is, is what you use to actually fish in your ice hole. So for those of you who've never done ice fishing, that's what a jig is. Um, uh, each, and we had a number of teachers, they shared differing techniques on how to put your line on your jig and um, how to tie it off. And of course, how to place it in some sort of a stand once you were out at the ice hole itself. All the women were given the tools so that they could repeat this and maybe mentor somebody else who wasn't able to be a part of this project and and show them how to use a jig as well. I have to say that hands-on learning cannot be underestimated. The joy, the precision, the understanding was immediate and you could see them, women who hadn't done it yet, get help from the women who just learned to do this. And, uh, and the other thing that we um, definitely encouraged the women to do was to be prepared with proper clothing. So you have to dress very warm. Uh, ice fishing is very stationary. You're not moving a lot. So you need really good footwear. You need layers of clothing because you're standing there. And on open ice, it can be very, very windy. And so that wind is even colder than the temperature itself and of course you're standing on ice so that the cold comes up through your feet so proper clothing makes this experience really comfortable and all the women came really prepared so excited to get out there when they looked at the techniques there was some examples that were brought and and so these were passed around and people got to explore it and unpackage it and then repackage it and and see you know if, if this was right uh, and there's always adjustments, right? The techniques are unique to each person, how you would hold a jig, where you would hold it, how you wrap your line, things like that. So there was a lot of excitement around, does this work? Could this work? I have this idea. And you could see immediately the richness of bringing women together collectively to just explore uh, basic techniques. You need techniques in order to harvest um, successfully. And then we headed out with our supplies. Now what you're seeing here, those orange buckets are your seats, but we, we put all of our stuff that we were using, our jigs and our backups and our scissors and our gloves and our blanket and everything else that we would have, uh, we, we brought those out and you can see that there's two elders that they're saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna head out on the ice. We didn't get to go right out on the ice. We got close and they told us again safety precautions like always look down because it's so easy to step into an ice hole unknowingly so you have to look down and then the branches that are there those are what we use to mark the hole so that others would be aware that oh there's a branch sticking up there there must be a hole at the bottom of that so we didn't have un unexpected accidents happen you can see that it's very much an open space but it's the French River and the French River is massive it has a lot of historical context and so that's where we're fishing we're, we're fishing on the French River and, and holding that uh, ice all was something else uh, it definitely uh, was connected to a lot of elder experience to, to even just get it started let alone and um, for the length of that all there, it had to go right into the hole how deep the ice was there. The ice was extraordinarily thick. Uh, it was over three and a half feet thick. Um, and then, and then how the water pops up and it's just a surprise, you know, you need to do in regards to ice. So um, women got to experience drilling holes and riding skidoos and cleaning out the holes make sure that their lines didn't get frozen in the hole because it starts to freeze almost immediately, which was uh, a surprise for many of us. Uh, 
Oh. And there was holes made for each woman. So each woman had their own holes. It took a while, but there was a hole for each woman. And it was in this big giant circle. So we covered a vast area so that we wouldn't be overfishing in the area, which again is an important teaching. Dropping the jigs in, uh, and we used live bait. We had minnows, um, was exciting for the women because they had worked with worms and now they were working with minnows. Uh, but it was lots of fun and the, the minnows are basically hooked by the tail and so they're able to swim while they're in the water and they're fine in the water but you had to keep your hole clean because as I said it was very cold and the hole would start to freeze in almost immediately which would mean that your line would become rigid and you needed to, the jig is bouncing, you're bouncing the line every once in a while to encourage the fish to come get curious and maybe take a bite of your minnow. It was very windy and the setup was was challenging we had to use like handmade snow banks to hold things in place but um what the women weren't expecting was the amount of patience it requires it was distinctly different from the open water fishing we spent a lot of time sitting and socializing singing songs bobbing our jigs every once in a while checking other people's jigs cleaning the holes um to to try and work around the the uh, the need to be busy you know the need to have something exciting going on all the time uh, we spent the whole day fishing but we didn't get any fish but it was lots of fun <laughs> i want to say miigwech for listening there were so many lessons learned in this the journey continues uh, we are going to be going spear fishing uh, probably uh, beginning of may up in dokis again and then our last uh, our last experience will be out in Georgian Bay where we will again revisit net fishing and rod fishing and some plant harvesting. It's been an amazing journey to date. I'm so excited to talk about it and share about it because it's something that I haven't actually shared with anybody as yet and um and uh, I needed pictures, you know, we needed to we needed to actually be engaged in that but my project will finish this summer and then I'll be looking for more funding to go through the next levels of my project so the next level that I want to focus on is harvesting from the land so hunting through trapping and and you know actually using guns and then the level after that that I want to go to is doing all things birch bark and then the fourth level would be traditional harvesting and gardening so wild foraging and you know, gardening in, in the methods that corn, beans, and squash concepts and why that's important and how they grow collectively together better. And then the last stage of this vision was to build traditional housing. So again, harvesting from the land and building things like sod houses, teepees, wigwams, um, maybe earthships, things like that. So that women know that even to get lost, you could create a form of shelter, you could find some food, you could take care of yourself, you could heal yourself. All of those things are interconnected and interwoven. You may watch, my friend. I really appreciate you sharing your stories with us today and your practices. It, it, it just brings everything to, um, to the forefront about how much we need to be able to be more understanding and connected with the land along with ourselves. So when you're not connected, everything doesn't work. But you put it together to it today for us in a in a really good way, and I I really appreciate all your words and your, your what you're doing for our communities. Chimi Gwech from uh, Heritage Mississauga, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Faith Chimi Gwech, for those reflections, those kind words. This is this should be so exciting for all of us you know we need to move forward collectively and support this so if there are any philanthropists who are paying attention to this you know think about where you want to place your money to truly support that road of reconciliation and health and wellness we're not looking for handouts we're looking for hand ups and that's what this project is about is really inwardly developing the strength and the skills to move forward as women and, and embracing mm -hmm. the power of of womanhood, you know, not just giving life, but being able to support life in truly meaningful ways. So it's been such an honor to sit with you and to share with you and, and to talk about this amazing project that I'm currently immersed in and, and hopefully come back again and, and maybe talk about the next level of the project. However it is, I'm definitely going to be circling around sharing as broadly as I can what the experience was like, um, what the learnings were, and, and maybe in 
inspire more women, not just indigenous women, but all women to, to step into this realm and, and feel like you belong there because you do. Thank you for joining the conversation today. We would like to thank Kim Wheatley for sharing the stories and traditional teachings based on Anishinaabe ways of knowing and including us in honoring the process of ancestral harvesting practices. We would also like to thank Faith Rivers for her continued support in this webinar series and as a director at Heritage Mississauga. Heritage Mississauga would also like to thank the Ontario Trillium Foundation's Resilient Communities Fund for their financial support to help us bring Indigenous conversations to a wider community through this webinar series. Join us next week as we welcome Diane Smoke Thomas, who will be bringing awareness about the history, current, and systematic issues and necessity for action in her presentation of Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. Register now on Eventbrite. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us to stay a part of the conversation.